welcome to another video. Today we are going to talk about kickstarting a Red Hat installation automatically. So kickstart is a word that actually is used in Red Hat Enterprise Linux and I have done a lot of installs of Debian using this simple CDD thing but it is a separate thing from the actual operating system but in the Red Hat Enterprise Linux, you have a built-in system to fire up new installations over and over again, which is really interesting and really great. The big thing, a difference between a Debian system and a Red Hat system is of course that if you install something called Enterprise, you have the support the SLA and everything that it means security to a big company. So you can just install something, use it, and if you have any problem, you can pick up the phone, send an email and get some help. And I were in the situation where we had a big problem with a large company and the large uh, provider of the software, and they actually had an SLA, meaning that they had personnel on staff during the whole day and night. They have people in America that answered to uh, whatever we did and then they fell over to someone in Europe and then in Asia and then back to America again. So they could actually give us an answer to our question 24 seven, which was really cool. So uh, there is a good uh, reason why you would like an enterprise kind of software more than the software itself, it's the support backend. So let's switch over to my screen here. Here I have installed Red Hat. And it's just a normal standard installation, nothing extra. And when you have done that, in your root folder, you will get an extra file here called Anaconda KS config. And that is the Kickstarter config, which is built on the choices you made when you installed Red Hat. And it's pretty good. You could actually use this config for your installation CD or media that you create. So if we look into this, we see that we have a bunch of different options here uh, with passwords and so on. But I'm gonna look a little bit further and I'm gonna go into my own uh, configuration here. In order to set up, set this up, you need a KS configuration and I prepared one here. So in this case, so we start up in this field file with language. So the language will be ENUS UTF-8. So that's our locale. And then I will ha have a keyboard and it should be a Swedish keyboard. You could put anything else there if you want. Then we have the time zone. I live in uh, Sweden, so Europe Stockholm should be fine for me. And the computer is set to ET uh, UTC. And then I have this time zone servers. So you can set up a bunch of different servers that will give you an NTP back and keep your time up to date. And then we have root password and a user that I create here. So first I set the root password and this password here, you can actually create your own. So if we go back to my console here and I type in OpenSSL password dash six. So this is the version six of the password. And I just create the password here and type in query two, two times to see that you get a similar string here. So that's the way to create those password. If you don't have them, I copied them over from my Anaconda configs. So I had the same passwords that I had uh, during the other setup. So that's how we create a user and a root password. Then you have a choice of uh, selecting how the installation should be done. You can either have graphical or textual. Textual will just give you a bunch of dots and typing out all the steps it does. With the graphic, graphical interface is the normal interface. It will fill in all the extra information and we'll get a graphical progress bar and everything. Um, so if you don't really mind the speed, then that is a good option to actually see where you are in the process. Uh, then we have the CD-ROM uh, installation here. If you have this enabled, then only the things that are available in this CD-ROM media will be the things that are installed. In my case, 
I actually need to go in and change this. I will comment this out because I have a base image where it doesn't have all the packages and so on. It just has the enough information to start up the installation process and then it needs to fetch things from the internet. So I will comment that out. Then the end user um, license agreement, you need to agree to that or else it will stop and ask you for an agreement. Um, when it has installed everything, we want it to reboot and eject the media so it can start up and being a working server after you have actually installed it. Uh, I don't want to install X because I have this as a server image, I will install software and run services. I'm not interested in a graphical interface when it's actually installed, so I will skip X. Uh, I will disable the firewall because this is just a testing environment for me. You have a bunch of options to set up a good firewall rules and so on here during the installation process, but I will skip those. Uh, then you have this auth select. Uh, and it's a way to say how your uh, authentication in the system should be set up. And the minimal one is giving you a normal password login and normal encryption and so on. Your home directory will be encrypted if you create something and, and say that you want a home directory uh, or a home drive and so on. In this case, you don't get a home drive if you don't have more than 50 gigabytes that you install onto your media. I install usually to 20 gigabytes. I only will get the root and the boot uh, drive or a, a partition. And then we have this RH, so Red Hat, um, and it's more of a sign up to their uh, subscription manager and Red Hat Subscription Manager, I think that command is called. And where you set in here is an organization and an activation key. So that activation key you can actually find on the Red Hat homepage. So we see here that I have a Red Hat subscription for individuals where I can have a bunch of servers installed. So if we look at this specific one, you see that I have nine servers installed already of 16 available. I haven't installed nine servers, I've installed it nine times. So I can go in here and actually clean up those uh, services uh, here. So if I want, I could go into the utilization, I believe, uh, systems. Yeah, so here I can go in and remove a bunch of these if I want. And then we have over here at manage, you have this activation keys. If we go in there, we see that I have this that is called name, sign me up, and I have this organization ID. So you can create new ones of these and just give them a name and then say that they are self-support if you don't have an SLA. And then you can have an automatic enabled and then I will choose this subscription for individuals and then I create that. So if I create something else called my subscription here, uh, subscription. So you can name it whatever you want and then you can use it in your uh, Kickstarter config. So if we go back here, we see that I have this sign me up key that I called it and the organization ID that I have. So I can go in there. Then you have this sys purpose. It's an optional thing that you can choose I, where you say what is the purpose of this machine. I say that it's a Red Hat Lin uh, Enterprise Linux server, this is a SLA is self-support and the usage is development slash test. But you could have production here for usage for instance and so on. So there is a, a couple of different options here. Um, then when it comes to packages, I said that I want a minimal environment because I will put more information in here if I do any installations and so on. But you could of course say that you want these kind of packages installed, you want a web server, you want some uh, database server perhaps and an, a language, then you just put it in here what you want to install. Uh, SE Linux, extra security for uh, your Linux environment. 
I disable it here, but it will give you this role-based uh, security where it decides if you actually have the access to do things. So even root doesn't really have access to do anything. Um, and then we have first boot enabled. Um, so we will run it on first boot. Uh, we will install the bootloader. You could add or append extra things to the kernel boot here in the bootloader if you want. Um, then we have a very interesting thing here. We have ignore disk. And this will say that we will ignore some disks when we partition the system up. But in this case I say ignore all the disks and you only use this SDA disk. And that is the only one I want you to install any software on. So it will partition that one up and if I have any other disks it will just skip those. Then we have CRO MBR and that will remove any old uh, master boot record. Uh, so it will install a new one there. Auto partitioning, uh, nothing strange there. And, and then we have this clear partitioning. This is the configuration on should you remove some of the partition tables and so on. And I say don't remove anyone but uh, set an initial label on your drive network I will activate the network and I will set the boot protocol to DHCP so it get get its own IP nothing strange there and then we have the SSH key last part here for the username we would then add this SSH key so if I do this it means that this key is um, is something that I already have uh, set up on one of my machines here so I could log in without entering any password. So that's really nice to set up an extra SSH key so you can just log in to the, all your machines when you have set them up. It's a very secure way of doing it and if you have password protected that key locally you have one password to reach all your machines uh, in a good manner from one point. So now that I have created my uh, KS config, some of these options are of course optional and have really good default values, but I went through them in order to show you what is good to, to set up if you create this kind of a file. Now finally we need to package the image up again. So we need to take this directory that we have created and fine-tuned and create an image again. And to do that we are running gen iso image and we are using a couple of parameters here. So first off we have dash u which allows you to use untranslated file names that is completely violating the 9660 iso standard. Next up we have dash r which is is very important because this will set the right ownerships on your files in this uh, distribution. Then we have dash V, which is a verbose execu execution. Then we have dash T, which will create a trans TBL file in the directory of the CD-ROM, just to help with file names again for specific platforms. Then we have the Juliet, J, -J generate Juliet um, directory records for ISO 9660. And then we also have Juliet long. So we could have 103 length of Unicode characters in our file names instead of 64. Then we have dash V, which specifies the volume ID. And then we have volume set, which uh, specifies the volume ID where the space is larger than 128 characters. In this case, it's not, it's the same. And then we have the application ID here. And we are taking these from the ISO Linux config. So if we look at this again here, these are specified as label here. So I will use the same thing to find actual stage when it's running. So it's important to have the same variables there, uh, at least for volume, so it can find that specific volume. Uh, next up we have dash B to find the uh, boot image. So this is a binary in the ISO Linux. So this is just something that it will run. 
Then it will have a boot catalog, so telling it which files and so on is available. Then we have the boot load size, which is four. Uh, so this is the number of virtual uh, 512 byte sectors to load in no emulation mode. Uh, so I guess that that is some size that is important for some, some hardware to actually boot. Then we have the boot table, which specifies that a 56 byte table with the information about the CD uh, layout, which be will be patched with the offset of eight in the boot file. So this is just extra information in the boot record for some platforms that require that extra information. And then we have the El, El Torio Alt Boot. So this is El Torio boot parameters, also for a specific platform. And then you have the dash E for the image for EFI boot image name. And this is important on any system that is native to Windows pretty much, because that is something that is very much used with Windows uh, systems to make it more secure than the actual uh, boot record on your hard drive. So you have a larger boot uh, record in your BIOS. So it's just not just a BIOS, you have an IFA re record as well that could boot things. And then you have no emulation boot, which specifies the boot image, um, for El Toro bootable CDs with no emulation. So there is a bunch of flags here. Dash O is of course the output ISO that we want to create. And then we say that we want to do it on the current directory that we are in. So this mount directory. So there is a lot of different flags here, but it's mostly flags that tells us uh, how we want to package it up so it can actually be run on all these different uh, kind of devices. So that's the whole uh, point here that we should be able to run this on as many devices as possible. And you saw that we had some problems to actually run this, which is a little bit strange, but the reason was that you actually had to mention this no emulator boot twice. So both after you have this isolate, isolating its uh, boot cat, you said no emulated boot, and then after the e image EFI boot image, no emulated boot. So you actually need to specify that twice as a parameter for some reason. But after you do that, it goes through fine, creating an image, writing it down, and then you will have an ISO image with a red hat that you just can mount in any files, in any virtual environment or put on a CD, DVD, or in a USB stick that could run ISOs and could be mounted and be run on a different system. The end product here for us was about 854 megabytes. So that is not something you can put on a CD, but DVD probably, if you ever use that. USB stick, of course, and very easily used as mount uh, hardware for a virtual environment. This was what I wanted to cover today. I hope that you found this interesting. I hope that you learned something today. If you like this video, give it a like, share it with your friends and colleagues. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that. If you have any comments or suggestions, leave them down in the comment section down below. And I really hope to see you in the next video.